You don't look right or left. Now you threaten to strip me of my prize in person, the one I fought for long and hard, the sons of Achaia handed her to me, his teammate. My honors never equal yours whenever we sack some wealthy Trojan stronghold. My arms bear the brunt of the raw, savage fighting, true. But when it comes to dividing up the plunder, the lion's share is yours. And back I go to my ships, clutching some scraps, some pittance that I love when I have fought to exhaustion. Now, in other words, and by the way, this doesn't seem to be contested in the poem. That Achilles is the great warrior, Agamemnon is the, great, is the, is the leader of all these troops. But it's, pure, it's pretty clear that it's because of Achilles that all the fighting that has been won um, has been won because of Achilles. And he says, and yet every time I have to give you, notice we have issues already introduced about issues of power and hierarchy. Who has the power and how does that power get used? No more now. Back I go to Pythia. In other words, he says, I'm done. You do this, I'm leaving. Better that way by far, the journey home in the beat ships of war. I have no mind to linger here disgraced, brimming your cup and piling up your plunder. But the Lord of Men, Agamemnon, shot back. Desert, by all means, if the spirit drives you home. I'll never beg you to stay, not on my account. Never. Others will take my side and do me honor. Zeus, above all, notice the first mention of the gods here, whose wisdom rules the world, you, He's talking to Achilles. I hate you most of all the warlords loved by the gods. Always dear to your heart, strife, yes, and battles, the bloody grind of war. What if you are a great soldier? That's just a gift of God. Go home with your ships and comrades. Lord it over your myrmidons. The myrmidons are the, you know, the soldiers specific to Achilles. You are nothing to me. You and your overweening anger. Interesting, the word anger here is used, and of course it's the opening word as well of the poem, right? Anger or rage. But let this be my warning on your way, since Apollo insists on taking my trices. I'll send her back in my own ships with my crew, but I, I will be there in person at your tents to take Briseis and all her beauty, your own prize, so that you can learn just how much greater I am than you. And the next man up may shrink from matching words with me, from hoping to rival Agamemnon's strength for strength. Oh, so there it is. Right away then, We've got this fight that's going on between the two of them. Achilles is ready to jack somebody. Namely, of course, uh, you, you can't let this happen without there being a response. And you've got to ask, why would Agamemnon do this? And, of course, the answer, and he'll say it even later, is he got upset. He, got, he lost his temper, and once he lost his temper, he didn't want to be shown up in front of the men. Oh, really? I'm going to reduce my teammate, and you get to hold on to your teammate? The fact that you even get to tell me that I have to give the girl back, and you still get to keep your girl, is a loss not only in my teammate, but also in my class. Well, to that degree, no, I ain't having none of it. Achilles is ready to jack him when Athena has to show up to remind him that Hera does not want any of this fighting between the two, a house divided against itself and all of that, right? So Athena shows up and she says to Achilles, now Achilles is the only one who can see Athena, stop this fighting now. I'm at uh, line uh, 240, 240, uh, 247, 248. Stop this fighting now. Don't lay hand to sword. Lash him with threats of the price that he will face, him being Agamemnon. And I tell you this, and I know it is the truth, one day, Glittering gifts will lie before you three times over to pay for all his outrage. Hold back now. Obey us both, both Athena and Hera. Uh, the irony is that Athena tells Achilles, go ahead and let this happen. Withdraw from the battle. It'll be fine. And you're going to have a whole lot more uh, Scooby Snacks, teammate, later. That is true, but it only happens after the death of Achilles' best friend, Patroclus. And to that degree, Achilles will increasingly grow to disbelieve in the idea of Team A, Scooby Snacks. We say Scooby Snacks are an illusion because of the Iliad, and, and, and we'll follow this one, right? So we're told she urged the swift runner, and he complied at once. He says to, uh, uh, to Athena, I must, when the two of you hand down commands, goddess, a man submits, though his heart breaks with fury. Better for him by far, if a man obeys the gods, they're quick to hear his prayers. So we have, this will be an interesting statement on the part of Achilles. If the gods tell me to do something, then I will do it. Fine, fine, I will do it. And so he backs off. Achilles then will begin to have his last words with Agamemnon. I'm with you at lines 262, 263 and following. Achilles rounded on Agamemnon once again, lashing out at him, not relaxing his anger for a moment. Staggering drunk with your dog's eye and your fawn's heart. 
Never once did you arm with the troops and go to battle or risk an ambush packed with Achaea's picked men. You lack the courage. You can see death coming. Safer by far you find a foray all through camp, commandeering the prize of any man who speaks against you. King who devours his people, worthless husks, the men you rule. If not Atreides, this outrage would have been your last. I tell you this, I swear a mighty oath, and here it comes. This is Achilles' oath upon it. I swear a mighty oath upon it. By this, this scepter, look. It never again will put forth crown and branches. Now it's left its stump on the mountain ridge forever. Nor will it sprout new green again. Now the brazen axe has stripped its bark and leaves. And now the sons of Achaea pass it back and forth as they hand their judgments down, upholding the honored customs whenever Zeus commands. This scepter will be the mighty force behind my oath. Um, it's interesting. There's an observation here that's subtly made that Agamemnon will never have any more children that his last child, Iphigenia, he sacrificed. And upon, of course, homecoming, he will get jacked by his own wife, Clytemnestra, and, of course, Orestes will never see his father, the son of Agamemnon, nor will Electra either, for that matter, okay? He says, I swear, someday I swear, a yearning for Achilles will strike Achaea's sons, now all the Greeks, and all your armies. But then, Atreides, harrowed as you will be, nothing you can do can save you. Not when your hordes of fighters drop and die, cut down by the hands of man-killing Hector. There we have the first real mention of Hector in the poem, the greatest Trojan warrior. Then, then, you will tear your heart out, desperate, raging, that you disgraced the best of the Achaeans. And this will then be the promise. All right, fine. You want to do this. This is your business, but I'm stepping away from this thing. We then have Nestor, who tries to step in. Um, now, this is the supplicant motif, as we often refer to it, where you find somebody who's going to try to step in and calm things down. You're going to see this a lot, where everything gets kind of wound up. And here we have Nestor, who, a, a great old man, and he has these like long, kind of winding-type speeches, but he, he steps in and he says, Don't seize the girl, Agamemnon. I'm on a line rough at 320. Don't seize the girl. Powerful as you are, leave her, just as the sons of Achaea gave her his prize from the very first. And you, Achilles, never hope to fight it out with your king, petting force against his force. No one can match the honors dealt a king, you know, a sceptered king to whom great Zeus gives glory. Strong as you are, a goddess was your mother. He has more power because he rules more men. Atreides, end your anger. Look, it's Nestor, I beg you, cool your fury against Achilles. Yeah, well, Agamemnon is going to answer in haste. It's an important line that he answers in haste. True old man, he says at, at, uh, at, at roughly line 333. True old man, all you say is fit and proper, but this soldier, he's talking about Achilles, wants to tower over the armies. He wants to rule over all. You can see, and this is important for your notes, let's write it down. This really doesn't have anything to do with Chryseis and Briseis. It really doesn't. What this has to do with is power. Who is in charge? And Agamemnon is saying, what Achilles is trying to do subtly is he's trying to prove to all of the Greek troops that he is more powerful than me. I have to show him up. I have to. I cannot back down. But this soldier wants to tower over the armies. He wants to rule over all, to lord it over all. Give out orders to every man in sight. Well, there's one I trust who will never yield to him. What if the everlasting gods have made a spearman of him? Have they entitled him to hurl abuse at me? And then immediately Achilles screams, yes, blazing Achilles broken quickly. What a worthless, burnout coward I'd be called if I would submit. Notice again this notion of submission. It's powerful in, this, in the opening book of the Iliad. If I submit to you and all your orders, whatever you blurt out, fling them at others, don't give me commands. Never again I trust will Achilles yield to you. And I tell you this, take it to heart. I warn you, my hands will never do battle for that girl, Briseis. Neither with you, king, nor any man alive. You Achaeans gave her, now you snatched her back. By the way, notice, it will be Achilles' insight that none of the Greeks stand up for him. So because they're silent, he will interpret their silence as, this is all between uh, Agamemnon and the rest of you. In other words, Achilles sees it as me against the rest of the Greek troops. And to that degree, you Achaeans gave her, now you snatched her back, but all the rest I possess beside my fast black ship. Not one bit of it can you seize against my will, Atreides. Come, try it, so the men can see that instant your black blood gush and spurt around my spear. 
In other words, he says, all right, I'll give the girl back, but don't even think about coming for any more of my team A. All you get is the girl. Once the two had fought it out with words, notice again the linguistic violence of the text, battling face to face, both sprang to their feet and broke up the muster beside the Argive squadrons. Achilles strode off to his trim ships and shelters back to his friend Patroclus, first mentioned, and their comrades. And then we will have um, Agamemnon, who will then uh, send the girl home. Now, note all of the interesting foreshadowing that's coming here, right? All of the irony. We're going to fight with each other and against each other instead of, of course, Hector and the Trojans. And this is going to lead to the death of a whole lot of people along the way. Now, the last part of our poem, lines 356 to 735 in the end of Iliad 1, we have several things that happen. Let's list them quickly. Chryseis is returned. Chryseis is taken. And Thetis is called. She will go and visit with Zeus. And Zeus ultimately has this little exchange with Hera that will then end the Iliad 1. Let's first of all go to, uh, back to the lines right at the beginning. At line 360, we have the first mention of Patroclus. At line, um, at, at line, um, um, I just want to make sure I give you the lines right. Line 365, we have our first real mention of Odysseus as versatile Odysseus is the one who's going to take back um, Chryseis. So Odysseus and Patroclus will be mentioned. They're obviously going to play heavily in not just this poem, but of course Odysseus in the poem to follow, right? Chryseis is returned. Chryseis is taken. Um, and when you can imagine what it would be like to be the two guys that show up to take Briseis from Achilles. But interestingly, Achilles by this point has already started to calm down. He realizes that he can't fight against this, so he's like, fine. Um, I'm in line um, right at 398 and 399. Go, Patroclus, Achilles will say. Prince, bring out the girl, Briseis, and hand her to them, the guys that have, uh, that have come, so they can take her back. But let both bear witness to my loss. In the face of blissful gods and mortal men, in the face of that unbending, ruthless king, if the day should come when the armies need me to save their ranks from ignominious, stark defeat, the man is raving with all the murderous fury in his heart. He lacks the sense to see a day behind, a day ahead, and safeguard the Achaeans battling by the ships, end quote. Wow. We're told that, um, in fact, this is exactly what happens. Um, Patroclus obeyed his great friend's command. He led Briseis and all her beauty from the lodge, handed her over to the men to take away, and the two walked back along the Argive ships while she, Briseis, trailed on behind, reluctant every step. She doesn't want to leave the tent of Achilles and, and go to Agamemnon. But, this is an important, interesting line, line 412, 413, but Achilles wept. And slipping away from his companions far apart, sat down on the beach of the heaving gray sea and scanned the endless ocean. Reaching out his arms again and again, he prayed to his dear mother. We're going to be reminded later in this poem, when Achilles loses his best pal Patroclus, how he responds. Here, we'll see it already foreshadowed. Two things. One, intense emotions, either in rage or in weeping. And then he calls to his mother, Thetis. Mother, he calls. You gave me life, short as that life will be. Again, this notion that Achilles knows he's going to die at this, at, this, at this battle of Troy. So, at least Olympus and Zeus, thundering up on high, should give me honor. Our, our again, notion of uh, Timae. But now he gives me nothing. Atreus' son, Agamemnon, for all his far-flung kingdoms, the man disgraces me, seizes and, and keeps my prize. He tears her away himself. Achilles will then make the, the request to his mother to go to Zeus. And I'm at line 483 and following. Remind Zeus of that. Now, go. That, that is it. Once, once she helped Zeus. And therefore, there seems to be a little bit of a suggestion that Zeus owes Thetis once for a time when Zeus was chained up and she was the only one to come and help, etc. Right? You also get this sense that she decided, Thetis decided to, to marry Peleus instead of, uh, instead of sleeping with Zeus. And it's almost like that was Zeus's idea more than it was Thetis's idea. And Thetis would have preferred, obviously, to sleep with Zeus so that Achilles would have been full god, not just parts, partially god. Remind Zeus and now go and sit beside him. Grasp his knees. We're back to that supplement theme, right? And that's the, if you're a supplicant on the battlefield, we're even going to see this later. You don't want to die. You know that you're about to get, you know you're about to be beaten. You will fall on your knees. You will wrap your hand around the legs of the warrior who's going to potentially kill you. You will reach up with the other hand, grab 
the beard of the one that you're fighting against, you'll raise your neck and look up into his face, exposing, obviously, your neck. So you're an easy kill. And, and here, already, we have some of this foreshadowed. In other words, Thetis, Mom, please go to Zeus and play supplicant here. Grasp his knees. Persuade him somehow to help the Trojan cause. To pin the Achaeans back against their ships, trap them round the bay, and mow them down. In other words, Achilles asks for Zeus to help for lots and lots of his own brothers in arms to be killed. So all can reap the benefits of their king, obviously speaking ironically. So even mighty Atreides can see how mad he was to disgrace Achilles, the best of the Achaeans. That is then will answer, all right, at line 491. They're bursting into tears. Oh, my son, my sorrow, why did I ever bear you? We're going to hear this again and again and again in the, in the poem. All I bore was doom. Would to God you could linger by your ships without a grief in the world, without a torment, doomed to a short life. You have so little time. This is a mantra that we're going to hear all the way through the Iliad. And now, only short, now, but filled with heartbreak too, more than all other men alive, doomed twice over. Oh, to a cruel fate I bore you in our holes. Still, I shall go to Olympus crowned with snow and repeat your prayer to Zeus who loves the lightning. Perhaps he will be persuaded. We're going to learn later that Achilles has two options, which is interesting because no other man alive, every man has a fate, right, when he must die. But it's Achilles who has two options. He can either stay here at the, at the walls of Troy and fight, and he knows he will die. Or he can go back, and he can live out a long life. But, of course, he's not going to have the Timae and the Kleos that's so important to him. And especially the Kleos, in the end, is what's most important to Achilles. He wants to be remembered, right? So um, you're going to have then the response, right, um, of Thetis that says, all right, I'll do what I can. Odysseus will return um, Chryseis to her father. The plague will end, and um, Achilles is without his, uh, without his girl Briseis, uh, Briseis, and he says um, that when we're told at line 581 and following that Achilles raged on grimly camped by his fast fleet, the royal son of Peleus, the swift runner Achilles. Now he no longer haunted the meeting grounds where men win glory. Now he no longer went to war, but day after day he ground his heart out, waiting there, yearning, always yearning for battle cries and combat. Um, I've had students who follow professional sports who have pointed out there's something very interesting about how in professional sports sometimes in the offseason, if there's a really nasty debate about how much the salary increase should be, that sometimes athletes will do this thing called hold out, and they know that it's going to upset their teammates if they don't you know, come back to the club at the beginning of a contest or at the beginning of a season. And yet, a lot of times, the hold out has to happen. Here, Achilles, he knows that a lot of warriors are going to die. That is to say, they're going to lose. But because of his desire for a teammate, Scooby Snacks, and of course, Cleos or Glory, he holds back and he's upset, right? Um, Thetis, we then here, will, um, will then go to Zeus in the next part of our story. And she will say, you owe me one, basically. I need you to help me out. But Zeus's response is fascinating. The minute that she, for example, puts her arms around his legs and supplicates for, you know, please help me do this, filled with anger. I'm at line um, uh, six... Uh, uh, 6.15 or so. Filled with anger, Zeus, who marshals the storm clouds, answered her at last, Disaster! You will drive me into war with Hera. He's worried first about his wife, right? She will provoke me. She will, with her shrill abuse, even now in the face of all the immortal gods, she harries me perpetually. Hera charges me that I always go to battle for the Trojans. Away with you now. Hera might catch us here. I will see to this. I will bring it to pass. Look, I will bow my head if that will satisfy you. Um, for those of you who are Godfather fans of the film Godfather, at that, mo at that moment when one of the Corleones will kind of nod the head, like, you know, bowing of the head, okay, okay, okay. That's the, that's the proof that Zeus says, okay, if I bow my head, look what he says. Look, I'll bow my head if that will satisfy you. That I remind you. That among the mortal gods is the strongest, truest sign that I give. No word or work of mine, nothing can be revoked. There is no treachery, nothing left unfinished once I bow my head to say it shall be done. Thetis runs off, and at the very end of Iliad 1, we have now another kind of fight. Again, you're going to see these typesets all the way through these different um, scenes, where now Zeus comes 
back to the gods. They've been gone for 12 days partying down south with the Ethiopians, and now they're back, and now they need some more partying on Mount Olympus with their ambrosia and everything, you know, and all of that. And as soon as Zeus shows up, the poet tells us at line 644, 645, but Hera knew it all. She had seen how Thetis, the old man of the sea's daughter, Thetis, quick on her glistening feet, was hatching plans with Zeus, and suddenly Hera taunted the father, son of Cronus. So, who of the gods this time, my treacherous one, was hatching plans with you? Always your pleasure, whenever my back is turned, to settle things in your grand, clandestined way. You never dine, you never do you freely and frankly to share your plots with me. Never, not a word. So in other words, Hera calls him out, Zeus, in front of all of the other gods and goddesses. And notice how this is very similar to Achilles calling out Agamemnon in front of all of the troops. Zeus is having none of it. The father of men and gods replied sternly, roughly 655. Hera, stop hoping to fathom all my thoughts. You will find them a trial, though you are my wife. Whatever is right for you to hear, no one, trust me, will know of it before you, neither God nor man. Whatever I choose to plan apart from the gods, no more of your everlasting questions, probe and pry, no more. And Hera, the queen, her dark eyes wide, exclaimed, Dread majesty, son of Kronos, what are you saying? Now, surely I've never probed or pried in the past. The, the irony is just dripping here. Why? You can scheme to your heart's content without a qualm in the world for me. But now I have a terrible fear that she has won you over, Thetis, the old man of the sea's daughter, Thetis, with her glistening feet. I know it. Just at dawn she knelt down beside you and grasped your knees, and I suspect you bowed your head in assent to her. You granted once and for all to exalt Achilles now and slaughter hordes of Achaeans pinned against their ships. And Zeus, who marshals the thunderheads, returned, maddening one. You and your eternal suspicions. I can never escape you. Ah, but tell me, Hera, just what can you do about all this? Nothing. Notice the use of power here. Right? Only estrange yourself from me a little more and all the worse for you. If what you say is true, that must be 